Alrighty. Um, I, uh, welcome to the stream. <laughs> I'm going to get started with some, some work on, um, some stuff in self tests for looking at, uh, the splice syscall and how it broke stuff. Well, how I broke stuff. Um, I wasn't the only one though. Uh, but there is basically a vulnerability I reintroduced. No sound. Hmm. Awesome. Okay, good. Thank you. Sorry. I thought there wasn't sound. Okay, so uh, what I was saying was I was going to uh, take a look at I added some panels, finally, um, with some links back to GitHub and some other stuff. Um, but today I wanted to look at a couple things. There are some splice tests that I wrote after introducing a vulnerability. Um, but then the entire splice uh, attachment got torn out, so now it's not even possible to reach that anymore, so I need to adjust the tests. Um, the, that's the, the first link out of my panel is the update splice test that goes to a conversation with me and uh, Christoph. But the basic version is the pseudo file systems like proc and sysfs and debugfs. Uh, you can you know open some arbitrary file in like uh, okay, sh what can I show? Um, the one that I was blowing up. Let's say, um, so in the sections directory under sys module, whatever you want, there's this dump of all the sections that were in a, a little kernel module. And uh, normally this, if you look at the, the DAC permissions, it's readable only by root. Um, there were some problems with this under uh, in containers in that root isn't real root, but the the test was only looking at the actual UID, so it was visible. Um, basically, it was it was wrong. I reorganized it to actually pass the proper permissions down into the handlers, um, but then discovered that the splice syscall, which lets you basically take a, a file descriptor and uh, you know sort of append it in a way to another file descriptor, um, would work. And that would let you control the size of the buffer more directly than uh, than normally. It was just read and write. There wasn't any issue. But with the splice, you could actually request a specific location, whereas seeking normally wasn't possible. Um, I can show you those examples here. So um, let's see if I have splice in my list. No, I don't. Uh, it's probably called module. Yes. So we're going to check out this. Do I have modules? Check out? No, I don't. We're going to do a work tree add again. I want to add my fix modules exposure test. I'll just call this splice since that's really what it is. And this is back in time a little bit where some things weren't uh, listed. Anyway, splice. Uh, let's take a look at this. So add module address visibility test. This is that top bit is what we're after. Um, so the idea is basically if you are, if you're looking at something in proc modules or proc module sections, um, and you don't have cap syslog, which is what I'm showing here, uh, it should not, 
that should not work. So this this just tests the um, whether or not things are working correctly as far as, far as the security the security checks. Um, but the actual thing that we wanted to take a look at, I'm going to um, let's call it splice. So if you look at the self test and tools testing the self test. Did I call it splice? No. Oh, it is. There is what got added here was, I think, short read. And this commit. Splice read. So I added a tool, added some timeouts and then short splice read. The idea being that if you don't do a, a large read, you can convince it to overflow the buffer that splice passes around it internally. Um, so the idea is splice read, I wanna read some file with so many bytes uh, instead of the full file. And if you look at splice read.c, this is just saying, we are gonna open a file as per normal uh, take a size argument for it um, and complain if we got too large a size and then basically splice the file to standard out um, and since standard out is just sort of constantly you know effectively spewing um, this effectively moves that file descriptor into standard out and things happen as per normal uh, but if i've specified this tiny size on the splice, then I'm only going to take a small amount in the kernel out of that file descriptor as I, you know, move it into standard out. And that was the source of the problem, is this was not a page-sized buffer inside the kernel. Um, so the short, short read was this splice does to say, hey, what happens if I only read, you know, here's reading a full page out of that file, what happens if I only see a couple characters, and things should you know, not blow up. Uh, so I tested a bunch of different file systems here. And uh, really the bottom line now is that all of these just fail now, uh, looking at looking at the conversation uh, with, uh, with Christoph because he effectively removed the splice interface from the pseudo file systems. Uh, so I'm gonna retain the test, but it's, uh, it's kind of, a silly test at this point because we should just expect all of these to fail now as opposed to as opposed to having any kind of discernible difference in their behavior. Um, so that's sort of what I want to start with is just uh, reproducing the error that um, that was reported on those tests after Christoph removed everything, uh, which would be a pretty pretty straightforward. It's basically all of the tests fail. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we can add a comment and say, since, um, let's see, the change was, I think, let's see about this. Place callback is removed as part of the setfs rework. All of these Let's expect to fail now. C. Place. Basically, every single one of these should fail. Um, how to test that cleanly, though, is sort of the question. Uh, because in the, in the failure mode, what we're getting was, let me just 
paste it in here real quick. I read. So it looked sort of like. Browser's not behaving. This is very exciting. Um, Kelly, no right. Uh, I am working on disabling some tests that are in the kernel because they don't work anymore, sort of intentionally. How strange. Anyway, let's remove this. Effectively, all fail with you know, splice. Invalid argument. In other words, the file descriptor in uh, in the splice read this splice says, "Hey, that file descriptor isn't attached to anything." Um, um, so user fault FD. So the um, well, the test here was actually the behavior of splice in, internal to the kernel. It didn't actually write out of, it didn't actually write out of bounds on the user space side of memory. Um, and uh, detecting that it overran the buffer tends to be not a thing that we've got in the kernel right now. Uh, there's a lot of tools and other assisting pieces, but uh, as it stands, this was an internal coding issue. And the idea was that this test was just to say, uh, this was at least detectable from the outside, so we should never allow this to be introduced. But since splice was removed entirely from from all of them, um, then it's mostly just readjusting this test so that we still have a test, but it and instead is testing that there is never going to be any splice work on this. Um, so this is basically what happens: is we get this error on uh, you know invalid argument exit failure. So we actually want this the short splice read is always going to expect the do splice uh, to fail regardless. Um, so instead of all of this, we just want to say, um, open comp two. So some of these are okay and some of them are failures. So it looks like proc was still a problem. Fun. At the history access module. So proc directly and proc sys. So we need to rewrite this in that these failed and these failed. This is the current FS. These are uh, proc single open and the sequence readers, and this is proc handlers, which do appear to have splice, uh, splice stuff. So um, we basically want to say uh, this should return what it gets, which we do. So we'll say zero. Not enough shell in my life. Actually, so we can skip all this. Can't we? I think. And then we can detect it. So this should just work out, I believe. Well, yes, we didn't actually make the tool here. Okay, so this is looks okay, and I can test it real quick by inverting it. Not work because of the set minus e. So hold on. So we say if I'll do this again. Uh, 
Hello, welcome to the chat. Okay, so test splice. Now we have to save. Well, we can turn off. We can turn off set dash e too, because we want to make sure that these are the ones that are okay and that these are the ones that are failing. Uh, so we'll say uh, if. So we're just going to count them instead. That is equal to a plus one. This is my crappy way of doing this, but um, it should work. And we'll move this down here. So this way, if we have unexpected stuff outside of the if tests, we'll be OK. Let's see. What do I recommend to understand the kernel better? A recent book. Man, that is tricky. Um, I don't have any good examples at the moment. Um, perhaps someone in, in chat has some ideas. But the um, problem is the kernel changes so rapidly. I'm not sure. If you're um, interested in more of a sort of security perspective uh, on, on, well, it's it's more of an offensive security perspective on kernel internals and just generally kernels and security implications. Um, there's uh, a good book called Attacking the Core. Let's see. Guide to Kernel Exploitation, Attacking the Core. That's an interesting read. Um, a lot of it is still relevant. Um, there's been some efforts to try to have the kernel defend itself from a lot of the patterns that are in there. Okay, so now this these are actually negative tests. So we want to say if we get it wrong, then we add these back in. get completely the opposite way of doing this. Um, Forty-eight. What did I do wrong? Right. Sorry, assignments. This is what I get for doing shell when I mean to be doing C, etc. I think there is actually a better harness for this inside of the test uh, inside the test tools. I want to take a look at that. Why am I still getting 48? Because this is shell, isn't it? Yes, it's dash, not bash. So I ha can't leave these unlabeled here. With bash, you don't actually have to include the dollar sign here. Again, still not okay. What am I doing wrong? Speaking, these are supposed to be double parens. Oh, you can watch me doing shell coding. So sorry. Again. Well, that's not going at all the way I want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, it's because these are not right. Again. Just keeps running up short. Limits, limits, com, probe. No, it definitely sees them as failing. Ugh. Well, let's go explore the things in self tests that are um, UK self test depths. Is this what we wanted? Now it's literal dependencies. Um, there's the runner, the 
prefix in the module. Maybe it was maybe what I'm remembering is the module self tests that are here. Params an individual test module. Yeah, that's literally for running the module. All right, we'll come back to splice here and take a look at the short splice read. All right, so we want this to just return whether or not it had the splice actually worked. So this piece is fine. Test splice is, um, again, if we, uh, if we fail do splice, we want to report uh, a negative. That should get us what we want. So this should be uh, these first ones we expect to fail. Hold on, I should add the notes in here. Um, proc hid has no splice uh, interface. These should all fail. Proxys has the splice interface. These should all succeed. And back to start with just the first set. So this is limits and com, and they should, they shall fail. And they're not failing, because we have an exit result. Um, so they're not failing, so that should be an error. So if I say badness, I still get an okay. Why? So this succeeds. on this if it's boring for people um, and move on to syscall redirection because I don't like writing in shell. So I, oops. So I see uh, so I see the okay so this returns zero which is fine and then this returns zero so this should be Exit correct, right? I'm not insane. What is exiting failure? Whoops. It's the reporting that's the problem. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. These should all fail. Those should fail. These should be okay. So the issue is actually that I've tricked myself with the okay. This is more like what I want. Um, and when we have things that actually go wrong in here, is um, where we want to do our recording. Fail. Um, 
twice. Should I get that? Okay, splice correctly failed. That's really what we want here. Yeah, it does seem like it would be an LTP, but um, I've uh, I want to use it's fast. So my thing is putting this in. Um, in the actual kernel proper, or the kernel self-test proper means there's some chance of it actually getting uh, getting run. Um, that said, I could certainly use to reorganize this a bit since I'm repeating these each of these uh, sections. Uh, let's see. And this should be... This should, should work. Correctly handled size changes. How about that's really what's going on? Okay, so now I'm running an older kernel, so this should ultimately fail, right? It says for the first couple of ones, the splice should not work, and the splice should not work there. And then splice correctly handled the size changes. That's good. And then uh, I don't actually load the module because I'm not running this as root. Um, but that is the correct expectation. So let's do. Uh, let's go look at our build. And I think I'm in. I'm in master, right? Yep. Uh, five nine. Uh, RC6. Uh, let's see if I can grab something that I know actually booted a config from recent work. How about the setcom config? Uh, ooh, whoops. Hold on a second. Let's swap that around. We'll build here. And switch around to editing over here. All right, reading chat. Um, let's see. Any recommendations on how to get more serious about contributing to the kernel? Um, that's really uh, tends to be a tricky question, just because. It's like what what are you interested in working on? I think that tends to be what I what I tell people most is uh, actually you know what do you what do you want to work on? Um, get to know that area, uh, fix things as you see them. I mean I've seen some people you know start slow doing typo fixes and documentation um, and slowly building that up, or some people bring an entire device driver or something um, with them and say hey I implemented this whole driver what do you want to do? I think some good starting points uh, are on the Kernel Newbies uh, website. There's the submitting patches documentation. Uh, if people drop some links for these things in the chat, I'd appreciate it. And then I can uh, keep on typing here. Uh, so let's see. I'm going to bring up, uh, let's see, this was Splice. Okay, so this is a much more recent kernel. And we'll go look at, you're welcome. Um, testing tools, ah, thank you, yes. Testing self tests. Oh, right. I could also do a make dash C tools. Testing self tests. Target or targets splice gen plus gen. Target. 
Tar, am I remembering this correctly? Nope. It's from my own history. So it's a snake file. It is targets. Why did that not work? Oh, sorry, it's doing headers install. Misunderstood. Anyway, it's getting the, it's just building the headers for this kernel first before it tries to build a self-test. This is my way of getting a self-test tarball with only the subdirectory I care about onto the machine with all the built pieces. All right, so then I can say, I want this self-test thing again. On the image, off it goes. Uh, actually, let's see where we are on this because I used to have yes, yeah, second PPF. What is the directory structure? Okay, self test and splice. So let's do let's make a separate subdirectory. Uh -huh. Twitch. So here we are with just the splice bits, um, and I can run, I mean, I can run uh, the full-blown, whoops, uh, the full-blown thing. But there it says, not okay, I failed. So let's go look at what I've got. This is the short splice read one. All right. So it thinks uh, splice should not work on those. And okay, no, I don't have the test module. Uh, let me go look. Perhaps this change is only in Linux Next. Is it only in Linux Next? Yes, don't allow splice read write without explicit ops. Copy, let's go back real quick and look here. Why my cut buffer is not working. Man, this is weird. There we go. So if this doesn't show up, then the issue is it's not in Linus's kernel. There it is. So this is basically what removes the splice hooks, uh, which is fine by me. Um, it contains that one. Okay, so that means it's in Linux next, so I shouldn't expect this kernel to work. So how about let's go copy this config to where I build uh, Linux next with great frequency. And let's try that one instead. Oh, I need to enable, hold on. Stop, stop. Test module. I want to have this test module. module test. No. Test under care underscore LKM. Test LKM. So this is just a module. Um, so it is in part of the, it is part of the config. Okay, build away. This is a. Um, a test module that basically just loads, says hello world, and doesn't do anything else, and you can remove it later. Uh, it exists mostly for doing tests of the module subsystem in the kernel, uh, which is uh, useful for, we, I think I poke at it in the kmod tests, and now in the splice tests, and a couple other areas. Uh, but it's handy for just having a module that doesn't actually do anything, doesn't have any dependencies. Uh, you can test that it's loaded. <coughs> Excuse me. You can test that it's loaded pretty easily. Okay, this build is almost done. Called Coverity because that's where Coverity is doing its daily builds, but it's really just Linux Next. 
So close. Okay, uh, let's get this booted. And get, it, uh, get into it. And let's go look at the splice test now. So this is what we're writing it for. This kernel. Okay, so happy, happy. So we have, we see here, splice, invalid argument. And we say no match. Okay, splice correctly failed. That is what we want. Uh, from those. And then it says, yes, yes, we did this. And I say, oh, right, I forgot the module again. So let's come back here and let's copy lib uh, test module.ko into x86. Because, uh, why not? This mod test module. Do, do, do. You can see it loaded in module and we can see it in the message saying, test module, hello world basically the hello world module. All right, so now it should be loaded. Um, oops, uh, sorry, short splice read is what we want. And this is good. We're getting the expected results now, right? So the first couple sets out of the proc PID um, all correctly fail. The stuff out of proc sys, they all succeed. Splice is correctly handling the size changes. And then stuff out of slash sys is correctly unavailable again. So that is the modified version of this test. Uh, much better uh, than sort of the mess it was in before that allowed for uh, unexpected things to happen. We don't like that. So having an explicit splice operation is now required for those, for those, uh, for those file systems. So we can look at what I did. I made a note. Um, I rearranged the expectations. It's kind of, I don't know, I feel like it's a little messy in the fact that I repeat the same thing over and over and over. Uh, so I'd really like some kind of wrapper there. That's my instinct. That said, you don't need to write, uh, watch me write a wrapper. So I'm gonna leave this here, but first, Commit and just add a to do for this. So splice. Um, just splice test for, uh, I don't know, pseudo, pseudo FS splice handler fallback removal. Uh, that's got too long. All right, splice test. That's obviously redundant to the fact that it is part of self test and splice. Adjust uh, for, and I guess it's not specific to pseudo file systems. It's more or less that the splice handler fallback removal happened. Um, and we're already talking about splice. So again, adjust for handler fallback removal. Sure, okay. Some pseudo. for this is, um, my goodness, why is, why is that being so slow? Well, let's go back to that. And I'd probably want to CC Christoph on it as well. Um, I think, I mean, I kind of want to fix his line, but it's a weird one because it's not, it's not really a fix. It's just, it was broken uh, after that change. 
it's it's weird. Also, it's in next, so they're coming in through different trees. So it's hard. I can't. I don't have a stable commit ID for that one. So I'm just gonna include the link. Um, I about say since uh, since commit, and then I just include a title because I will not have a stable SHA for this probably. But what I should do is go look and see if um, Christoph's tree has stable commits. So let's go really quick. So here I'm going to go look at um, the, the git trees. I'll just dump it into, into the stream for a second and into the chat. Um, I'm looking for Christoph's, um, Christoph Helwig. It's part of, probably part of the VFS queue. So I'm looking now at this URL and looking at his for next branch. I should be, I would expect the splice bits to show up here. And it doesn't. Mm -hmm. This is one of the tricks is uh, doing commits between trees against stuff that's in Linux next. Um, is It's harder to track down where things came from. So I'm just gonna leave this for the moment and say, to do, add, Shell wrapper to avoid the cut and paste or the copy paste. To do find a stable shell for Christoph's commit. Um, because if we look in, so if we look at the Coverity tree, sorry, not Coverity, it's the Linux Next tree. I just haven't built it. Um, the top commit, if you're looking in Linux Next, is effectively what. Uh, Stephen Rothwell did what he collected for making this particular Linux Next, and you see the names of all the trees that he was working through, um, and then all the files like he actually includes where everything came from. Uh, so if you look at Next trees in the Linux Next tree, now none of this stuff exists in Linus's tree. All of this just doesn't get included later. Um, we could look for, for example. HCH, and he's got DMA mapping one, and configFS, and he's got a bunch of, I see, he's got trees on InfraDead, um, and NIT. Anyway, so it's kind of all over the place. So what we want to do is see if we can get a git log, see if we can find a stable SHA here. Um, sorry. Of this commit, the three E36, whatever. And that won't work here. Uh, so if I do show no merge, merge show. There, cool, cool. Okay, so let me show you that cool trick. Um, merge show. So the question I am asking is I have this SHA. Where did it come from? How did it enter this tree? Through what merge? Uh, did this enter the tree? Um, and I have merge find and merge show that came um, from uh, it's from oops, someday I will learn to type. I should show as merge find. These were gloriously copied out of, I don't know, probably Stack Exchange or something. But anyway, it's this insane set of commands and, and Git shortcuts for finding where Merge came from. Um, so within the current tree, you basically go back through the lists, find the Merge, and then Merge show is take the result of that and actually show me the thing and then do a Merge log and whatever else. But the whole point was I wanted to say, where did this commit come from? 
And the answer is it came when Stephen Rothwell imported the VFS for next into, into his tree. So we'll look at that name, the VFS, and I'll say next trees and figure out where this came from. And we don't know VFS. Okay, so it'll be called VFS. It's one of these two. It's probably Vero's tree. And Vero tends to have pretty stable shaws for his, so I'm just going to trust that that shaw is correct. So what do I want? I want that commit, and I can amend what I'm doing here. Whoops. There's one of my other tools. Get the short commit that I want. Since commit, blah, blah, blah. We'll get rid of these. Uh, okay, pseudo file system do not have an explicit splice fop since commit foo and now reject uh, attempts to use splice in some in those file system paths. And I want to give credit to the fact that the, um, the LKP zero day bot is the one that yelled about this uh, because it actually took the tests I had written and took the next tree and ran them together and said, hey, look, this test failed, um, which, you know, that's the point of the tests. So uh, I would like to include that in here. Kernel test robot. So let's do kernel test robot. Run, wrong HN. And then we can look back through some of the commits and decide if that makes sense. Calling it, uh, giving a named credit to that to the person instead of LKP. All right, I'm just going to do that. Leave it as is. Uh, let's take a look at this again. I think I removed one to do. Add a shell wrap. Okay. All right, so I'll add a shell wrapper, but at least give you that sense of how to write up that commit. So if anyone goes and says, why are you doing this? They can go see the full link and everything else. Okay, let's move on. Um, another interesting thing uh, that I haven't been able to sit down and really spend time looking at, uh, I, did, I looked at earlier reviews, is this, uh, here, let me make some room for it. Um, I think I actually had, was checked out. Yes, it's called redirect. So this is an earlier version. I think that's the v4 based on looking at my directory tree. Um, yes, the KSPP is called redirect since I was sort of including it. I wasn't sure at the time which tree that was going to go through. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is rearrange this a little bit to rename things. Um, rename this branch Again, this was this was actually the V4, and now hello, emoji waves. Um, and if we look at the the one I'm gonna review, it is well, it's in the links off my panels, but it's this link. Um, that's sort of the start of the V6, I think, the V6 review. So let's uh, check out, let's first look, I like, I'm gonna review that really quickly to see what was his base. Do we have any idea what his base uh, 
tree was for this, and it's not clear if he's based on Linus's tree or next. Oh, there it is. Please note this applies on top of Linus's tree uh, and succeeds a set comp and sys call user dispatch self tests. So they added self tests for this because it's a pretty unusual, interesting feature. Uh, so we will start from. Let's. Uh, this will remove this. I'll get rid of the syscall redirect. And clean up the stuff. And then we're going to say git work tree add into Linux build. Uh, what do they call it now? syscall user dispatch, syscall user dispatch. And we're going to base this off of uh, Linus's tip of tree and call it syscall redirect v6. And you know what, I should probably keep a consistent name. Okay, so this has checked out Linus's tip of tree into the separate work tree under a different name, and there's nothing different about it yet. But if I do a B4 uh, TLS uh, dash O dash of that thread into git am, this will work, I think. No. Where there was a way to do this. Uh, get, oh, I didn't actually give it a command. Sorry. Am. There. Okay, so this looked. This went and fetched the whole thread, tried to figure it out. Um, and then added, since I had asked for it to add my signed off by. Uh, it added, that's just muscle memory. But we also see the axe from, uh, this is, yeah, axe from Christian, um, and the links from where they were downloaded from. Uh, so now I have the tree that's made up of what just came out of there. So what this tree does, if I can find, if you read that, that first cover letter, um, this is mostly directed at Wine um, for running Windows stuff under Linux. Uh, traditionally, the Windows sort of execution model was to always make explicit library calls for doing system calls into the kernel. Um, so that it was, this, this meant it was pretty straightforward for Wine to do that kind of intercepting of you know, Windows syscalls because it's not it's not running on Windows, uh, because it would just have the library mapped into memory that provided the sort of uh, the shim between a Windows syscall and a Linux syscalls for, for what it needed to do. Um, this made things super easy because there were no syscalls being made in the actual Windows binary. Uh, it was just making library calls. Uh, over time, this has begun to change to the point that uh, now there's like you cannot run some Windows binaries because they're making native system calls, native Windows system calls, um, which obviously is not going to work under Linux, um, especially when Wine is attempting to continue to do kernels that like regular Linux syscalls. Uh, so there, you couldn't apply what might normally happen, like a personality flag or just replace the entire syscall table or do strange things like that. You actually needed this hybrid mode where uh, calls out of a specific region, like where Wine had loaded itself, is going to be all, you know, standard Linux system calls, normal stuff, no big deal. Uh, and if anything else appeared, uh, if a system call was made outside of that region, uh, Wine effectively needed, needed to trap it, needed to catch it. Um, now, the existing mechanisms in the kernel for doing this, uh, you could do that without any kernel changes, but it was super duper slow in user space. Uh, for example, uh, you can 
you know, map regions not executable and on every step it's going to go, you know, send a signal and then gets caught by user space and has to, you know, make a whole round trip to decide what to do next. Uh, there, there's really a lot of, a lot of weird tricks, but if you're doing that with every instruction, it's terrible. There's a bunch of weird ideas about how to, you know, work around this. But it's super, super duper painful. And slow is really the main, the main problem. Um, so the idea was here to set up, this was initially aimed, and why it came to my attention, it got aimed at, at SecComp, because SecComp already does syscall interception. Um, but this really isn't a security boundary because it's a translation layer. It's not attempting to confine anything. It's just trying to translate the syscalls. Uh, so it doesn't it didn't really map very cleanly onto what SecComp was trying to do. Um, so it was redesigned to sort of be standalone. Uh, that said, the way ptrace, seccomp, audit, uh, ftrace, the way that those things all intercept syscalls uh, is to set a flag in the process, and when the kernel, you know, when, when the process enters kernel mode, you know, it's making a syscall, uh, the kernel checks those flags and says, oh wait, I have to call out seccom first, or I have to call out the ptrace, or, or whatever. So the idea here was we can add another flag and do this user syscall dispatch, or, sorry, the syscall user dispatching uh, by, oh hey, this flag is set, let me check what, what address we're at and decide which thing we should do. Um, so my main issue with the later versions of this tree, or of the series rather, um, was the method by which uh, the flag was getting set. Uh, and this is especially awkward in the face of the, the recent rewrite of the kernel entry code, uh, that sort of the generic entry code that was made recently. And if you watched last week's stream, uh, there, was, there was a lot of my confusion of walking around in there trying to figure out where things had moved to. Um, but the point is that this syscall user dispatch could actually be architecture agnostic. Um, so it got rebased on top of this generic kernel entry code, uh, but we still have the problem of figuring out wh how to map these flags. Uh, and this is something that came up even uh, when, when the generic entry code was being reviewed. It's like, now we have a whole set of flags that are, you know, really only operate in the generic code, so maybe they don't need to be sharing the same space as the other flags. Um, and this is a problem because we started to run out of room for flags. Uh, I think that the flags were like a 32-bit and we just started to run out. Um, so anyway, that's what I wanted to look at. Uh, and looking at this, we're going to have, we're going to take a, a first look at the, um, this initial commit that says, hey, look, we need a syscall interrupt intercept flag, which says we want to inter intercept the syscall. Um, and this applies equally to the, uh, the syscall you know, user redirection and seccomp and ptrace and audit and ftrace, like all of these things uh, need this flag. Right, right now, actually, uh, oops, I'm a master, did I? Ha, <laughs> I imported the wrong place. One second, please. I'm in the wrong tree. Um, this was syscall redirect. There we go. Let's try doing that import again. All right, much better. So what I want to do is go back and look at the original stuff. Um, hey, cool. You're welcome. Um, I hope it's useful for people uh, starting up on this. I touch on a lot of different weird things. But hopefully it's interesting. Uh, so if we look at how this works in, um, of course, it's all been rewritten. Let me think about this. Best way to describe it. So it's TIFF, which I think is like thread info flag, and then work. 
So uh, let's look in our x86. Let's look in ARM64, which hasn't been rewritten. Okay, this is more interesting here. Uh, so this is this is ARM64 that is not currently using the generic entry code, which is sort of how everything looked before this most recent uh, these most the most recent Linus Linus tree. Um, so there are these the TIF the TIF flags. There's all these different things like signals pending. Does it need rescheduling? You know, there's there's a bunch of stuff in here, and then there's one. Uh, called syscall work. The idea being, if any of these flags are set, we actually have to stop and go off and deal with them. And then, uh, you know, go from there. And you'll see that we've got trace, audit, trace point, sec comp, and syscall emulation. Um, so if we go look for that again, we can see This is where ARM64 would catch a syscall. I'm going to look at work. It says, you know, this is the test. Has syscall work? And we look at that set, you know, oh, now we check on entry. Hey, syscall, we have work. So let's do, you know, I'm going to ignore some of these other finer details. I'm going to do a syscall trace enter. It actually retains the name trace enter from when trace was the only thing doing that kind of interception. Um, Copy this out. I haven't done my C tags build in here. So this oh it's still in there. Oh, no, it wasn't. Uh, kernel P trace. So here you see that this is what gets called if any of those flags are set. And then in here we basically just check each one of these flags. Is it trace points? Is it this? Is it that? Some of them embed it like. The secure computing for seccomp uh, tests that flag internally to that uh, to that function, um, so you can see this is just a tiny wrapper that says if the thread flag is set, then call it. So each of these does its own um, its own test. So basically, you get the idea that it's like all these flags. And audit does a test internally as well. Um, so the idea uh, is that for this first one, point is well, how about we have one flag that says syscall intercept, and then later we can figure out what in the world we were trying to intercept, and we don't have to sort of clobber all of these. You know, we don't have to use up all these flags in the thread info, uh, which is running out of room. Um, and so what's What's been proposed here is uh, a struct around seccomp, which I, I don't understand why this is necessary. Why can't they be separate things? Um, uh, I'll go look through more closely. Um, but in reading through it, um, this provides transitional defines because, again, this is aimed at the generic code. But how do we deal with that if there's you know, generic, we're trying to build this feature for both the generic and not generic. Um, and we've got either TIFF seccomp or TIFF syscall intercept. Uh, and it's the idea being that if your architecture is expecting to do this, it has transitioned itself to syscall intercept and not, it will not be using the individual flags in the thread info. Um, and if you, and if you haven't, then okay, if you've defined if sec comp, then you should do this other one. Um, <laughs> Yoda Droid is asking um, if I'm streaming from a 72 core, 188 gig RAM machine. No, I'm streaming from my poor laptop, but my build machine is a 72 core, 188 uh, gig machine, um, which is hopelessly idle at the moment. I should just build. I should build something on principle. Um, Let's see, so this basically replaces uh, this idea that seccomp is now gonna be using the syscall, which, or the syscall intercept flag, which I, I can't say I'm super excited about. I would much, much rather that the syscall intercept be its own thing. 
Um, I'm fine with, sorry, the user space syscall redirect code be its own thing. Um, and that the this flag sort of encompass all of them. Uh, so that's that's a piece. So this this is mostly these are mostly inlines for adding and removing the syscall intercept. And again, these these helpers are doing uh, spin locks on there, which I I don't I, I think is gonna be um, overkill. I mean, I see what they're trying to do because what you need right now, you just set one flag and off you go. It's not a big deal. Whereas if you have this sort of, if you have these multiple flags where you say, I want to <clears throat> perform a syscall intercept and you set the flag, you actually have to set two flags. So what happens in the race? Um, <clears throat> I still kind of think this is, um, I think this is overkill. I think that the syscall interception could be an entire, uh, like an entire 32-bit flag itself, and the kernel can actually just test that the entire contents of the flag. <clears throat> because if it's non-zero, then something needs to be intercepted, and then we sort of don't need to do any of this, uh, any of these shenanigans with extra spin locks. I really don't want to add locking around this. It's it's a bit heavy for what what we're trying to do here, so I think my my main objection is I want to be able to safely set these modes <clears throat> um, without <clears throat> without heavy locking. Um, but if I look past that piece of the implementation, um, we see sort of syscall interception happening here. Um, as it's sort of, you know, uh, it gets transitioned for set comp first, and then it gets transitioned into the entry code. And I mean, I like the, I like the transitioning. I don't like the specific implementation of how that's, uh, how, how the intercept flag gets done, but the, the sort of progression of how to include that in the kernel is nice. Um, so here's the VDSO. Um, now this is feedback from Andy Ludomirsky basically saying, where are, where is the signal trampoline code? Because that's sort of a problem for, if we're gonna be intercepting syscalls, we don't want to suddenly block signal return handling because uh, you'll end up in this loop uh, effectively. Um, the idea was, well, how do we discover these landing areas? Uh, and it looks like that conversation basically resolved to, well, we can just stick them in the VDSO to be discovered. Um, what is uh, what is day-to-day -day work for a kernel security engineer? I don't know, you're looking at some of it. <laughs> it's like reviewing code, writing code. Um, I haven't really shown dealing with uh, security incidents just because that tends not to necessarily always be in the public. Um, sometimes I'll hop on threads uh, where some flaws being discussed and people are talking about uh, fixes that are not quite right. That's usually where I pop up if I can catch it in time. Um, anyway, so this, this export of, of the SIG return address, sure. If it, if it helps the author and makes Andy happy, uh, I don't have much opinion about it. Um, and then this is adding a new uh, SIG sys. So the idea is that using SIG sys, which is another reason this was aimed sort of at seccomp, uh, this is another SIG sys type. Like when you catch this uh, SIG sys, you can look at the uh, SIG info structure and it'll tell you, well, what, what, type, what type of... Uh, SIG sys, why? And traditionally there was just the one seccomp. Um, SIG sys was mostly unused prior to seccomp stepping up to actually do something with it. Um, and this would be a user dispatch signal. So you'd be able to tell the difference between the two. Um, and that looks totally fine. And in fact, I think, yeah, my, oh well, I, this is on act, I guess. I have a signed off by because I 
imported with dash s. But this one I would totally act immediately because of course. Um, this is the part I think that actually implements this whole thing. So this adds a new PR control. I wonder how I should pronounce PR control. Uh, it was pointed out to me some time ago by a, uh, a person who had come into the Unix world kind of sideways um, that slash proc should not be called slash proc because as the lists it is, it is supposed to be used for the lists of processes and the short hand of process would be pros if you're going to stop talking in the middle of the word. So uh, he always referred to slash pros and it confused me to no end. Um, so that I've, I'm faced with the same thing with PR control because PR is short for process. So I do percutal. I'm not going to say percutal. So PR control it is. Um, all right, so this introduces a new PR control that says, you know, I'm going to do user dispatching. I have this operation. Um, and then the start and end address and whether or not it should be on or off. Uh, and this, this got debated back and forth a bunch of times. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm one part I'm looking at a little bit is to see, is this, you know, um, how do you, how do I pronounce IO control? IO control. I've heard people say IOCTL, IO cuddle. Um, just a there was just a tweet on this about <laughs> a colleague of mine using a different pronunciation for IO control every time he said it. IOCTL is yeah. So we'll start the the religious war now on <laughs> on chat. IOCTL, IO cuddle. I, 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 yeah, I can't, I, I EO cuddle. <laughs> let's, let's keep you on and on. Uh, anyway, I think this interface has been fine. It, it got re-architected a couple times. Um, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, and all the feedback I had on how to add the K configs on this, you know, if you have an architecture specific thing that you're adding, spell out, uh, spell out the, the actual requirements. Like what does your architecture need to implement to get this thing? Um, now, this is being aimed again at both generic and non-generic entry code. Uh, this, this entire series might be shorter if it was aimed only at the generic entry code because then you don't have this idea of have arch syscall user dispatch because all of the things listed there are already required by the generic entry code for x86. Uh, so that's probably a question I will ask on thread about this. Um, so again, this is using the interface that um, uh, that I wasn't super happy with, but the basic basic method of getting this done, I'm, I was happy with in early implementations, and I know it hasn't changed much. Uh, OK, so the next one. is so this is the kernel entry code this is actually making changes to the common code for this and it says i mean it's really straightforward because it's so clean i think now where we say hey if we're doing you know if user dispatching was requested for this process go call into it and do it and be done uh, this is what i absolutely love about this series is that um, combined with the generic entry code, this is so, so, so clean. And I think that if we do the rework of the, uh, you know, sort of the syscall intercept uh, flag handling uh, in a way that is less, less locky, uh, I think this is, this will be a huge improvement. And we gain back all of these, all these flags, right? When I was showing As I'm thread info, yes, yes, and work. All right, so suddenly if the syscall work list, I suddenly gain back one, two, three, four, I can make five different um, different flags out of the flags that were already sort of starting to run out of. There's 26 and a 32-bit, uh, an unsigned 32-bit. In on x86, this is even, 
I think even more crowded. I think it's at 32, in fact, at 31. Yeah, it's at 31, right? And the reason this this series doesn't make it 32 is because they're effectively right here replacing sys, you know replacing tiff set comp with syscall intercept but i think we can go a lot further than that and look at uh, syscall look well that's been removed but anyway um because this is using generic code now it's a separate thing but in the past um let's see looking at chat uh do you need to understand uh, the linux kernel and study all of its modules uh, if not, which situations do I need to understand the Linux kernel? Uh, well, I, uh, I think that's entirely up to your level of curiosity. All right, if you're a daily Linux user and you just, you know, expect to do whatever with user space, you probably don't need to pay much attention uh, to the kernel. I think that's the expectation is you wouldn't have to. Uh, that said, if you want to do anything special, then you start learning about sort of uh, interacting with the kernel from the outside. Right. What modules do you want? What options do you want to set? And most of that stuff is pretty well documented. Um, and then if you start getting curious about how do those things actually work? How, how is it that this module gets loaded? Um, then you start digging around in the actual kernel itself. Uh, there's questions like, is there some kind of out of tree feature you're interested in? Then you start learning, how do I patch stuff? Uh, how do I build my own? How do I boot my own kernel? Uh, that, that tends to be the process that most people follow and into sort of getting into it is follow what's interesting, um, follow, try to find the solutions for the things you need to do. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I would agree. You do not need to understand every line of the Linux kernel, otherwise you will go crazy. Uh, there's, there's so much written by literally thousands of people. The idea is to make it readable enough that other people can figure out what's happening in the code they didn't write. Uh, that's the, the idea of the shared maintainership uh, for the kernel, um, which can be tricky when you have people with deep domain knowledge trying to write code that no one understands. Uh, so comments are important, good variable names. I mean, it's all sort of best practices stand for that. Uh, okay, getting back to, let's see, I don't know if I did the five, did I finish this? Oh yeah, it's super short. That's what was so nice. And then there's um, this. So this and this is the piece that I, I don't I don't I don't see the purpose of. If we can add it to the generic code, we don't need it. We don't need to tell the architecture that it also has the support for it because either it does or it doesn't. Um, you know, if you move to if you move your architecture to the generic entry code, you should just get this feature. Um, it, it shouldn't be an issue. The PR control should be sufficient, uh, which actually gets me back to taking a look at one quick thing. Redirection. Ha. <laughs> Thanks, yes, that is, that's, I, I, uh, the, the HTOP layout is <laughs> someone else has noticed. <laughs> I, I needed to figure out what to do with all this giant space above my head next to the terminal. Uh, so I figured, why not? I'll just have the HTOP running there. Uh, so I forgot, I wanted to go look at this PR control again really quickly to say, how does it figure out whether or not uh, it can do what it can do, and I think the answer is just that the TIFF flag exists. So yeah, that's no big head top. Yes, exactly. <laughs> top of my head. I, think I wish my brain had seventy-two cores. Um, okay, continuing on. So yeah, I don't think that patch is needed. And then super happy to have self tests. And if you're here for earlier in the thread, um, or earlier in the stream, <laughs> uh, I was working on self tests because if you if you can't test it, who cares if it got written? You have no way to check for failures, you know, regressions, etc. So I was super, super, super happy to see um, these getting added. I had to sort of sort out where to get the headers from, um, and then have the the config for it. 
Actually, does that config exist still? Uh, and then it's all in here. It actually does this kind of dispatching. You know, this is sort of a, a chunk of, um, uh, of what like wine would be doing. You know, it looks at another process that's been forked off. So here, let's go look at, no, maybe not forked off. I think it just does it internally to catch it. Anyway, we can see what this looks like. Let's copy again my second config to here. And does this, does this config actually exist still? I'm looking for the kconfig entry for this because I thought the point was to just make this universally available. Yeah, it's still there, okay. I'll just slap it in here because uh, off we go. Whee! Let's go shut down the other machine. And this thing now you can see HTOP lose its mind. So this is a, I haven't spent a lot of time looking at this, but this is my uh, QMU setup for doing like the quick tests. Um, I've got uh, effectively three boots, boot scripts. Uh, Go is just sort of the standard start the thing. Uh, and that boots into the 64-bit image. Uh, Go i386 is for booting the, the i32 kernels, the 32-bit uh, things for which I have a, a separate um, a separate image. Um, it looks like I have not updated that one. I can see my ext4 focal image for standard Go. And Xenial is still the, appears to be still my old i386. Um, and then UEFI because booting into those images through UEFI uh, is a different path. So if I'm testing boot paths, it's important that I look both at sort of the standard standard bootloader and a UEFI bootloader. Uh, UEFI bootloader requires these uh, OVMF files. Um, I've been doing fun things with PStore and, uh, and looking at UEFI and doing NVDIM images with UEFI. Uh, there's a bunch of weird things. Then I have some pretty old these were old scripts for booting a specific, I think this Yocto image that I ne never got rid of and everything was broken. Yes, yeah, CFI variables, everybody's favorite. Fill them all. Yes. Oh yeah, if you need a builder real quick, it is pretty cheap to get them on AWS. It seems like the main costs on AWS are, are with, uh, with data transfer. So I think it's, it's pretty nice if you just haul a little source in once and you're okay. Anyway, uh, looking at the cores, looks like my build is done. My build is done. Let's boot it. Where are we? Syscall redirect. Okay, syscall redirect. And once again, let's do a dash C of targets. Uh, what is, what was this? 49, yep. Add self test is called syscall user dispatch. Is the name of the self test target. So let's get this. And off we go. Header install. Oh, you know what? This is single threaded because I didn't have dash J. Oops. I gotta think about that some more. Okay, let's do our S copy again. Uh, does, does Google provide you mass amount of CPU for that kind of stuff? Well, that, that 72 core machine, uh, I did not buy with my money. That, that came from Google. Um, and uh, that's, 
it's pretty handy when the kind of builds you have to do are things like, hey, uh, rebuild all of Android. Um, I haven't had to do that in quite some time, uh, but yeah, it's it's super, super painful. <laughs> Gustavo says, lucky me. Yeah, but you've got twice as many CPUs as me now. <laughs> I'm gonna bring that up on every stream. Okay, so here I am, I transferred the self-test. Uh, this is our kernel booted with, um, yeah, this is our RC6. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get rid of the old stuff. Whee, and get this unpacked, okay. So again, I could just run it from the top level because that's super easy. And what does it say? Module test, oh, did I not? Oh, I did the wrong thing. Hold on. Did it not copy or did I? Oh, right, sorry. I included the full path, which includes the splice tree. Oops, oops, oops. That is what I want. Let's try that again. And run from the top level. And this says, cool. I'm going to start up, you know, so let's call user dispatching. And I've got my six tests. Everything passes. All things are good. And if you look uh, at me attempting to do this on, like, the local kernel, um, this is called user dispatch. Now, this, uh, that feature doesn't require root at all. That's the whole point. Like, this should be just available because it's entirely taking place inside the process. So uh, here I am, if I want to run um, yeah, syscall user dispatch, this would just fail, ooh. Network failure? How strange. Am I still streaming or did the whole thing just break? Oh, I'm still there. How weird. I had one of the little windows over here tell me I had a network failure. I don't know what that's about. Anyway, sorry for that. Um, back to this. So if you see, this is my, like my stock, you know, whatever stock kernels on my build machine. And sure enough, everything fails. There's no PR control. There's nothing. They all fail. Great. So happy, happy. Their tests work. So that's great. So looking again at... Looking at their tree, I'm quite happy with the self-test because the exercise, uh, everything in there, I'd looked at that before, so I'm cheating a bit. And then the last one is the full documentation on how to use it. So, uh, I mean, again, that's having read through this before, I know that this is all fine. So mostly it's a matter of me trying to come up with an alternative to the syscall intercept piece, which I'm not, I'm not super do not really enjoy all that much. Um, so instead of you watching me type up everything I just said, um, I'm going to finish that off stream because again, you don't you don't need to me walk watch me walk through it. But uh, you can, if it's interesting on how I would start with that, I would start from the the lore URL that was in the in the topics list for today. And I do something like reply to that one. And I'll go fetch the mailbox for me and poof, there is a whole mailbox and I can go through here. And I can do easy stuff like self tests. Uh, I can do I have a macro to reply to this and say I think it's a little bit stronger than reviewed, so I'm gonna say act. Say um, this Passes, looks good. And again, thank you again for the self tests. Um, so now he at least knows I am paying attention again. Let's see. Reading chat again, real quick. Figuring all that stuff out. A lot of work. Okay. 
documentation I think looks good. Um, and I think review is fine on that. Um, that's six. That's eight and nine. So I'm sort of almost working backwards. Um, so where's the one where we say enable? So this one, uh, I'm gonna apply and say, um, like there's there's too many configs. <laughs> what is that at all? Um, Is, uh, since there is since there is a uh, there is a uh, top level I guess top level config for syscall user dispatch it feels like overkill. These are the easy review bits. So seven, eight, nine, uh, six was entry support. I mean, this is unbelievably clean. Uh, I guess there was a discussion on doing this before before P Store. Yeah. So that's that's that discussion. So fine, I'll let that carry on. That seemed like it resolved itself. PR control got... There's some talk about how this should be. Yeah, that's fine, that's good feedback. Um, I, don't, I don't really need to add anything here. I was happy with this API. It got tweaked a bit, but Fundamentally, it's like an internal usage issue, and they're, they are the user of it. Oh, that's not uh, terrible hacks. All right, so this one is, yes, this one's easy. And again, I feel more strongly than just reviewed by. This oh, looks good. I should say seccomp is glad to have a <laughs> seccomp is glad to have a new success friend. And let's see what else we wanted to say. Back to three VDSO. I don't have any opinion about this at all. Um, and Andy's acted, so that's fine. Three, I would say, I mean, I suppose if we look at it. Planning pad, return pad. If it's I386, we always expose it. So this actually has nothing necessarily to do with it. Is the commit log sufficient? To not be captured. Dispatching syscalls from that region to user space. And we are reporting. All right, we're reporting a position inside the VDSO. So I have no concerns about this being a um, some kind of weird kernel exposure. So I think this is fine. One question. Uh, 
uh, which is does would anything else benefit? Would anything else? Just out of curiosity. That's three, and then we start getting into the intercept flag. And yeah, anonymous struct got called out already. Um, bike shedding or naming style. So it was around that. I do not want that bypassed. Um, that should not be a thing to think about. So what he's talking about is the struct here keeps these together even if structure layout randomization has been enabled. Um, and the idea is that structure layout randomization already has a performance mode uh, as, as it was designed. Um, to keep things that are near each other, near each other still, even if they've been rearranged a little bit. The idea being to keep them together in a cache line so you don't get as quite as severe a performance hit when you turn on uh, structure layout randomization. Let's see. Uh, say structure randomization already has um, Line issues. Uh, leave this as just a new member. No wrapping struct. Now this is part of the task struct, which I am. That's sort of what I wanted to see was a single flag moved into there. Um, and let's see what else. And it's about the specifics. So I'm going to come back to the support being made here. Changes to interception and similarly, yeah, it looks like some of that has already been commented on. So I'm going to comment on this a little bit more. do is say, don't, uh, can we eat all the other flags, trace, audit, etc. All right. That's sort of my review there. I can come back to that if I have a better idea. What have we got time for? Um, so the other topic I wanted to at least poke at and look at and maybe talk about. Um, <clears throat> was seccomp constant action bitmaps as as I call it. If you're not aware, uh, seccomp is basically a, uh, a attack surface reduction mechanism that a user space process can sort of declare to the kernel, hey, do these things if I ever make, you know, strange, unexpected syscalls, right? I am, I'm expecting only to ever do these things, so if suddenly I start making weird syscalls, please kill off my process or do these other things. Uh, the idea being that if 
a process that has been well confined suddenly gets attacked if anything else right the the expansion of that attack can't include other unexpected syscalls potentially uh, making it harder to exploit the kernel directly through a process, things like that. Um, it also has a whole bunch of stuff for monitoring, and there's a ton of stuff sort of built into and around SecComp. Uh, the thing about it, though, is it's using BPF, which is effectively a virtual machine instruction set um, to do the work. Uh, and that can ultimately get slow if you set up if you set up filters for all kinds of things. It can get slow to run them. If you look at proc status self, um, there is a seccomp line that tells you what, what seccomp mode you're in. Uh, here, I'm unconfined by seccomp of any kind. But if we go look at, say, this one, uh, there is an additional line in a more more recent kernels, uh, which says second filters, which is how many filters have been applied. Uh, because all the filters get run, uh, so as you add more filters, strictly speaking, um, you end up with a, you know, it gets slower linearly, we hope. Um, and there have been complaints over time with very, very large filters, even if there's not a lot of them being very slow, uh, you know, not and very slow in the sense of being able to measure the overhead more directly. Um, if you look at things like, uh, I know I think Resolve D, System D is a heavy user of second filters for things that it launches, which is nice because they're trying to be, uh, you know, confined by default. Um, but if you look at it. <clears throat> They have what I find to be a staggering number of filters attached. Uh, there's a whole thread about this, about how that came to be. Uh, they're, they're using libseccomp, uh, like most people, um, but to handle, you know, on, on x86-64, to be able to handle the potential three different architectures that might be running, you might be running, you know, native 64-bit, you might be running x32, which is 64-bit, you know, uh, in 64-bit syscall-ish instructions, but with 32-bit memory addresses. Uh, you might be running IA32 in compat mode. So all these seccomp filters are in there multiple times for the different interpretations. Um, anyway, point being that they're all running. It's kind of, it can get complex. And most of the time, the vast majority of seccomp filters tend to just be either, yes, let this through by number, right? I accept all, um, you know, all thread exits, whatever. Um, or you say block this syscall by name. You know, init module. You should never call init module if you're not expecting to. Um, so and those just you know kill the process or allow you know allow the syscall through. The vast majority of those filters are this like effectively a bitmap. Um, which is ironically how mode two seccomp was initially proposed. Um, anyway, so um, the idea here is adding bitmaps back in, but we don't have to do it in a way that user space even needs to know about. Uh, we don't we don't have to introduce a new API because we can actually look at um, how, how a filter might, uh, let me show you, how a filter might be defined. So right now, when you, uh, when you write a filter, sorry, it's in the UAPI stuff. Okay, when you write a filter, you're looking at a bunch of things. You can filter on the syscall number itself, which is obviously the, the main thing most things are going to be doing, um, and the architecture. Usually what happens is the first instruction in a filter on a multi-arch architecture uh, will check the architecture number and move on. Um, and the next thing is what the syscall number is. And if you don't care about anything else, that's it. You haven't accessed anything else in the setcomp data when you're writing that filter. 
if you don't care where it came from, if you don't care about any of the arguments that were passed in, um, you're just going to do something, in theory, simple. Um, you're going to do some specific action. But the action depends only on the syscall, I mean, the architecture syscall pair. But we'll just pretend architecture doesn't exist for a second in describing this. Um, you only care about syscall number, and the, the result of your filter will never change. Whenever it's that syscall, you always have the same uh, action. And that can be expressed very efficiently in a bitmap. So the kernel can just look at the filters as they're being loaded and build this bitmap on the fly, uh, radically speeding up the filters. They go from you know a complexity of big O n to how many filters you have and the length of those filters uh, to big O one because it just looks it up in the bitmap and does it. Um, so that's that's a piece I want to get back to um, because probably the number one complaint or sort of feedback I get on SecComp is performance concerns. Uh, so that's, uh, that's sort of the next place uh, I wanted to go, and I, I had put it in, in the topics, but you can see sort of the larger thread, I'll put it in chat, uh, a larger thread there was um, on creating this. And I did some in really ridiculous things um, to detect whether or not a filter was accessing memory beyond the architecture. Uh, that used like the the TLB and page table, uh, whether or not things got touched, like it's, it's pretty kind of awful. Um, and at the time, very architecture specific to x86. Uh, Jan Horn correctly pointed out that I could just do this with a small emulator. I was not wanting to write yet another uh, BPF emulator that might break and do other things. Uh, but he pointed out that it's actually very, very short. There's such a limited set of things already in BPF filters, which, you know, the verifier already uh, enforces. Uh, my concern was mostly with, like, all the math that can be done, right? I have to make sure I build an emulator that handles all the math correctly. Like, that doesn't sound great. If I could just use existing systems in the kernel to do all that, I'd be much happier because they can't diverge. Uh, however, very little math actually happens uh, in BPF filters. Um, and so I sat down and actually looked through libseccomp and Chrome, which uses its own native generator um, and something else. I forget at the time, but it's in this thread. And it turns out that only two math operations basically ever get used out of those libraries. Uh, so to write the emulator, it's a matter of just you know, adding the math bits to the very, very small bit of uh, execution, uh, very small bit of code that uh, that Jan actually just wrote up in the middle of that email. Um, so that's that was the piece I needed to do was bring those back together, get it uh, get it rebased onto the current kernel, and see what it looks like. Uh, let me go see find find Jan's email with the example and paste that in here just so you don't have to dig through the whole thread. Yeah, it was his first reply. Um, was was here in chat. You'll see he talks about, you know, the the actual actions are incredibly short because all the only things that really happen are loads and compares uh, and, and the jumps. Like, and the, the verifier effectively already does that, but the verifier also allows quite a bit of math, but again, the math isn't used by hardly any libraries, so if the constant action bitmap thing, because if it doesn't understand it, it can just say, eh, it's, you're not going to be in my bitmap, and you'll just run the filter like normal. Um, but as long as it works in most cases, it'll have a benefit uh, to run speed. So I, um, I liked this approach, so that's my plan for rewriting it. Um, instead of doing the rather ridiculous stuff that I was, uh, that I had done the first version of. Let me see if I can go find bitmap. Yes, so if you look at bitmap code, most of this was pretty straightforward. Um, 
but I had crazy things like provide an API for local kernel TLB flushing and then enable constant action bitmaps and I can just tear all that out and it becomes architecture agnostic and we're fine. Um, and then I had the uh, really exciting test cases here. <laughs> this, is, this is a patch I will not be sending upstream, which basically reported at every function, or sorry, at every filter load in the set comp, um, how much coverage there was. In other words, was this a bitmap? And through what, uh, which syscalls did it provide coverage for? Uh, I don't think I have an example of the output, do I? No. Um, but this was, this was where it was heading. Um, let's see, I'm getting hungry. And I've got about four minutes left. So let's take a look really quickly at, at a, well, here's my four next tree. Let me make a look really quickly at uh, the thread for, um, my current second tree. Apparently yesterday there was another tree or another uh, discussion on this, but we'll get there. Um, clone. There we go. The V2 that I sent on this to see if Christian has act everything, which I think I think he did. One, two, three, and four. He did. Okay, so here's what we'll do. Um, I'm gonna pull this is called tree or uh, second tree down. Let's call this. Uh, it's not really B3, but we'll call it that anyway. Whoops. Reset it to here. And do a git am, no, no, sorry, before am tls of this branch. Let me see this again. Dash, go dash. Get am. Whoop. Okay. And I've even checked my own attestation. <laughs> All right, let's look at this and make sure it doesn't look weird. All right, so there is the sign off for me when I sent it, the act from Christian, the link to there. Christian had one comment on a typo I had. So let's fix that. Tools, testing, soft setcom, setcom, PPF. This is called the ring ptrace entry. Record, this call, this is what I want. What's our diff? Smash to there. I am happy. And, okay, I can, that will be my new base for doing, for doing the work. Um, am I working right now? Yeah, basically. Um, this, is, this is part of what I do as a second maintainer. Um, so we're going to make a new branch for set comp, and we'll call this bitmaps again. Okay, so this is when I'll rebase the, the bitmap code onto. So here's where I was. And I say rebase and I probably shouldn't. Um, so what I really want is a cherry pick from here. And we'll see what it blows up on. 
course it goes up there. So my set comp. I'm gonna look at where the collision was here. And I added some things. So yes, we keep that. And that was the only thing, so that was easy. And continue. Yes, yes, do 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 do. And weirdly, the x86 stuff was retained, but I don't want to use it. So let's rip out the first part. Like I was saying, we do not want to do this. Um, and is there anything left? Here. Yeah, Secom bitmap. Secom bitmap. Yeah, we don't want any of that. So let's just rebase and drop them. And goodbye, goodbye. We're left with those. Now, obviously, this won't build because I removed the config from that. But this is sort of the base. And I want to look at. Um, where we do like TLB flushing. This is the whole routine where we do an update bitmap. So instead of uh, doing this emulation here, where we go through, we step through every syscall, and um, this used to prepare how we would detect the change. So instead of running it here, where we'll do our new filter evaluation at this point, uh, the one that um, that we or basically given by Jan. And we just gotta tweak it a little bit. Um, anyway, this is this is where I'm probably gonna stop for the moment. Um, what is a splice test? Uh, that was earlier in the stream, if you wanna go back. Um, but the topic is linked from the front panel. Uh, and it was basically fixing it for the splice, is fixing a test for the changes recently visible through the splice syscall. Anyway, so this is probably where I'll continue working later today after I uh, eat, because I've been talking for two hours. So that's about where I am. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Um, that's, you've spent quite a bit of time with me. Uh, you know, send me questions or whatever if you want, uh, or if you're interested in specific topics, uh, email me. I'm curious what people have found interesting. It's been, it's, uh, some people have been interested in like Git tools. Some people have been interested in process. Some people have been interested in the like security mitigation, security flaw mitigation work. Um, anyway, it's been fun. Thanks a lot for joining me. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Take care. Bye-bye.